Hello everyone and welcome back to The Great Book of Grudges. My name is Nathan and today we're going to be talking about demons. More specifically, the demons that the lore has forgotten. You see, with Warhammer being such a long-standing franchise, 40 years to be in fact, many creatures have been introduced and then sadly completely forgotten about for one reason or another. Now, we know about many different types of demons within Warhammer, not just fantasy but 40k, Age of Sigmar, there is armies of them. You know, these are the ones that you can field, these are the ones that you can play with, but what about the others that might be fairly unique in their own right? Ones that might not be tied to specific chaos gods, potential demons of undivided or demons of other deities that we just don't hear about. And today we're going to discuss just that, from the uninspired to the very curious and to the outright confusing. So yeah, let's begin. We'll start off with the Mirror Vampire. Not much is really known about this creature, introduced in the first edition of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay and completely forgotten about thereafter. Mirror Vampires are a kind of demon, not undead, which cause inexperienced witch hunters much confusion. They can enter the world when summoned through mirrors and are eager to come out to drain the blood of more living creatures. They're less keen to return to the realms of chaos, but most spells used to summon them only allow them into the world for a fixed length of time, usually a matter of minutes. With the little that we know about this creature, it already seems to be a rather unique demon, but it gets even more curious once we start looking at how to really combat it and how it exists in this real world. The two special rules as follows. Frightening reflection, the mirror vampire is invisible in the real world, however it does have a reflection. The reflection appears as a floating cloud composed of pale faces screaming in agony, constantly boiling in and out of existence. These faces are the faces of the monster's victims. Anyone able to see the reflection is subject to the Mirror Vampire's frightening talent. And then finally, Mirrorbound is how you fight it. Simply attacking the space occupied by the Mirror Vampire in the real world is futile and does no damage. However, if the attacker and the Mirror Vampire are both reflected in the same mirror, and the attacker aims by looking in the mirror, all attacks do normal damage. So the only way to actually fight this is by having a mirror alongside you, using that as a way to aim your actual attacks. No distinction is made as to who the mirror vampire follows as a patron deity, and it could be assumed that this is a demon undivided, as we do know that more than just the Furies do exist. We'll briefly talk about the Uninspired, a Balrog. Yes, a Balrog was originally in Warhammer Fantasy 2nd Edition, and it's a type of greater demon. It is distinguished by its preoccupation with fire and fire-based magic. Balrogs are winged humanoids, often covered in flames. Fire spurts from their nostrils and mouths, and their eyes glow like coals. They are large, always over 10 feet tall, and often much bigger. Naturally, there's a reason why these creatures were never really included again, mostly because there would have been problems with the Tolkien Foundation. But what I find very curious about the Balrogs is it wasn't really linked to another demon, which is very interesting as by this point we already had personification of the four Chaos Gods and a few others. So it could be that this was another undivided style demon considering that not long after we did get a little bit of detail regarding Furies. Well, back then they were called lesser demons. Now, the Balrog does return under a new name and a new look. Now it is known as the Balrook. A Balrook is a type of greater demon, distinguished by its affinity for fire and fire-based magic. There are believed to be only six Balrooks, and their names are closely guarded secrets, for it is said that whoever knows the true name of a Balrook can command it to do anything. Balrooks, like most greater demons, regard themselves as the nobility of the demonic planes. Rivalry between them is intense, and each will claim to be the prince of all Balrooks, or some other spurious title. A Balrook may even claim to be a demon prince, or a god, if it is sure that no such entity can hear. They are generally contemptuous of mortals who summon them, and will frequently try to destroy their summoner. Failing this, they will seek to pervert any orders they are given in order to cause as much destruction as possible. It is dangerous to threaten a Baal Rook, and those who summon them and try to control them by force usually come to an unpleasant end. Baal Rooks may obey orders for a time, but will invariably 
seek some opportunity to take some revenge, Balrooks have long memories and never forget an enemy. Characters who trade with a Balrook usually have a greater success provided that the stakes are high enough. Balrooks resent having their time wasted. Moreover, they have had thousands of years practice in the striking of bargains, and those that summon a Balrook frequently find their orders being carried out to the letter in a way which turns out disastrously for them. So again, very interesting. Now it's more like a, a bargain demon. It depends on how you want to see this. Different mythology has ways of implementing demons like this, where you'll be able to bargain with them, make deals with them, but they will eventually screw you over. Very curious, again, not listed under any other deity. Once again, at this point, we already knew of the deities like Nurgle, Korn, Zinch, so it could be understanded that there was more of a push to bring in demons of Undivided, which is something that Games Workshop employees tried early on, yet it didn't really work out. Perhaps the most interesting of the demons is the Imp. You see, Imps exist in Warhammer and they exist as extremely minor demons. But at least here, in the second edition Tome of Corruption, we do actually get distinction between all the different gods. So let's talk about these Imps. You can see they're little adorable creatures, aren't they? Imps are the least of the least. Minor demons that are born from loosed emotions. In their natural state, they are amethyst things, endlessly cycling through a variety of shapes that seem to reflect the thought or concept that birthed them, it is only when a dark god claims an imp that it becomes something. Dark magisters and chaos sorcerers conjure imps to serve as familiars. So familiars and the concept of that has always existed, and this means that obviously they're not really that forgotten, but the name of imp has been long lost. We do know that a undivided state does exist, but we don't know exactly what they look like, possibly like the image that we see over in the right hand side of the screen. And even then, their shapes do twist and turn, so this might not be the truest representation of an imp. But we do know that four distinct types of imps do exist. The first is the Bubo. Imps of Nurgle are tiny versions of Nurglings, being delicate, fragile, foul, and green. They look like small withered peas, but are dimpled with sphincters that issue foul yellow wetness. These creatures thrive on sickness. The feeling. Imps of Zinch are small balls of pink flesh, like a miniature horror of Zinch. It sits and quivers, expelling blue and pink flames from its many mouths. When it moves, it pulls itself along with pseudopodia, scorching the ground wherever it goes. Feelings inspire rebellious thoughts and acts of anarchy. Next is the Malice. Imps of corn are miniature warriors encased in black armor. They look like tiny chaos warriors, and indeed, they have the temperament of the most vicious corn champion. Malices feed on rage and hate, inspiring both in mortals. Now, it's very curious that this was named that, considering that we do have a chaos god or a former one known as Malice. I'm assuming at this point, since the Tome of Corruption happened post the issue with copyright, it was to keep the name but use it for something completely different. And finally, the Muse. Imps of Sinesh are appealing, taking the form of beautiful young women with perfect nubile bodies and long hair of scintillating colors. They are tiny, no taller than three feet, but despite their size, they have power over men, stealing their souls and draining away the capacity for sensation. But they're also inspiring, urging their victims to new heights, always pushing further and further to attain the glory they seek. So familiars are slowly coming back to lore. I believe they're starting to get reintroduced in Age of Sigmar, which is kind of nice. But their original name has been lost through time, which is a shame considering that imps are kind of interesting. Again, another undivided demon that can be claimed. The general gist of undivided demons is so weird in terms of lore. Hopefully we do get a little bit more detail regarding it, because I imagine that Old World will want to kind of push a little bit of undivided lore first before it starts to break away. Next we're going to talk about the Marbofrax. Also known incorrectly as the Plague Elemental, the Marbofrax is in fact a solitary greater demon. It is said that it is a servant of the Chaos God Nurgle, the Lord of Corruption, but little is known of its true nature. It can manifest itself as a foul, stinking wind, but it is most effective when it takes physical form. On those occasions when it does appear into the material world, the Marbofex spreads disease and pestilence, wiping out whole populations. So this is pretty interesting for a number of reasons. 
It's a greater demon, very curiously different to other greater demons of Nurgle that we know of, the great unclean ones, as this one is a lot more lankier, more twisted and turned by disease rather than being engorged by the very plagues that power it. Now, some people might see this as the precursor to the Plague Bearers, but it does seem that the Marbofex is around 12 feet tall, making it a very large greater demon. We do know, obviously, that not all demons have been discovered and studied as it stands, so it could be that other greater demons of other Chaos Gods do exist, and this is one of the perfect examples. With another weird example being the Mardag. So, yeah, this does look very odd as you can see, and it is very strange when we go into its lore. So sometimes mistakenly called the Death Elemental, the Mardag is a greater demon serving the Chaos God Korn. When a Mardag is summoned, it does one thing and one thing only. It kills. The killing spree of a Mardag can only be ended by banishing it to its home plane, either by killing its physical form or by magical means. It appears as a huge robed hooded skeleton over 10 feet tall and is typically armored in chainmail and carries an immense scythe. Obviously very different to what we know of most corn demons, this seems more magical and means rather than actual killing machines. The Mardag itself might actually be some form of demon prince, as explained during the Archeon novel, where in the Southern Chaos Waste a large fortress does exist and belongs to the demon Mardag. But, then again, there could be many of them. We don't actually know exactly what they are, and it could very much be more of a primal extension of corn. The other demons, such as Bloodletters and so on, while bloodthirsty in their own right, still feel command, they still know what to do. We know of Bloodletters being great commanders in battle, so why is this one so different? We've seen a Mardag attack before, they've attacked Marienburg, they've attacked Remus in Talia, so it's very possible that there are multiple Mardags all over the place. Well, hidden away at the very least. One theory that does go around right now is that the Mardag is the personification of death in battle by Korn, meaning that there might be other demons taking different shapes and forms depending on the state of emotion and the state of rage or power that the current Chaos God is making manifest. Obviously something like this needs to be studied further, but it's very difficult to go into the realm of chaos, any of the gods' realms, and being able to study the gods themselves. Nigh on impossible, really. Now you might think we're done, but before we do end this, we're going to talk about demons of law. You see, the chaos gods of law, all the gods of law as they're now more commonly referred to, used to have demons of their own right, as they were birthed originally in law at the same time as the chaos gods to act as their counter. This is a concept that doesn't really evade Warhammer, especially if you look towards 40k, where the Legion of the Damned is sometimes considered to be demons of the Imperium, or even how Ascension works for some of the Sisters of Battle. But to date in Warhammer Fantasy, we only know of two, the first being the Titans. Titans are the lawful equivalent to Sentinels, and they are also called Sentinels of Law. Their role is as guardians of the dimensional gateways that lead to the dominions of the Gods of Law, and as agents of those divine and humorless powers, Titans can be represented by the plastic knights of lore, you guessed. Titans appear in the world as messengers and agents of the gods, and might easily appear anywhere. As natural adversaries of the Sentinels of Chaos, they also often appear to counter the terrible chaotic forces. A fight between a Sentinel and a title is a terrible thing to behold, for neither creature will give in until the other is slain. The Sentinels themselves for the Chaos Ones have been kind of rewritten to end up being the greater demons that we know of today. But yeah, large creatures as we can see, basically looking like giant knights, with the image of Sulkan for this one in particular, which is kind of interesting when you think about it, because the cities in Talia which have giant constructs that look very much like this. So it could be that those Sentinels are the living vessels for the actual titan spirits themselves. Not much has actually been heard of these creatures since way back in the day, but there is another demon of lore which has recently gotten mentions. 
The Vidag, sometimes mistakenly called the Life Elemental, the Vidag is a greater demon of law, and it is concerned with the laws of life and nature. It is rumored to have been created by a lawful deity to counteract the depredations of the Mardag. The Vidag appears as a young and beautiful woman, over 10 feet tall, dressed in flowing robes and with long flowing hair blowing in an unseen wind. The robes and hair are frequently decked with flowers. The Vidag recently got a mention in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th edition, which means that it still remains in canon. Funny enough, the Gods of Law are returning slowly but surely, so it's not lesser known, but it does bear that greater demons and even demons of law do exist, we just haven't heard of them yet. It's likely that as, as the lore of the Gods of Law starts being fleshed out a little bit more, we'll start to hear some creatures or operations it's very strange to see it this way as demons of law don't really make sense but it also kind of does but in any case i wanted to talk about some demonic curiosities in warhammer are there any that i've missed let me know in the comments below let's have a little bit of discussion i know that these topics are always a bit uh interesting and also weird but i think it'd be kind of cool to see the return of all the demons possibly reshaped and reformed because let's be honest it's been a while since we've seen new demons in the warhammer settings all of them to be in fact so it would be kind of cool now, with regards to elementals, which have been mentioned a lot, don't you worry, I will have a video centered around the elementals themselves pretty soon, I hope. But with all that being said, have a good day, and I'll see you all again very soon.